Hello and welcome. My name is Colin Hennessy, and on behalf of the entire UChicago alumni team, it is my pleasure to welcome you to today's Harper Lecture. If you've joined us for a virtual or in-person Harper Lecture before, you know firsthand this 41-year-old UChicago tradition brings faculty to cities around the globe to share their insights and research. Thank you for joining us and for sharing your feedback. We are all so happy to hear that you're enjoying this virtual series. Now, before we begin, I have a few brief comments. There will be three people speaking today. You'll hear my voice, our faculty moderator, and our faculty presenter. All other participants will be muted. We would like you to participate by asking questions. To do that, type a question in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen anytime during the talk. If you have issues with audio, you may want to shut down programs running in the background or dial in from your telephone. We are recording today's lecture and we will make it available on the Harper Lecture YouTube channel. Our, our presentation will last for about 60 minutes. Our faculty expert will speak and then we'll have plenty of time for questions. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our faculty for today's lecture. David Nirenberg has written widely about the ways in which Jewish, Christian, and Islamic cultures interrelate. His books include Communities of Violence, Persecution of Minorities in the Middle Ages, Anti-Judaism, the Western Tradition, Neighboring Faiths, Christianity, Islam, and Judaism in the Middle Ages and Today, and Aesthetic Theology and its Enemies, Judaism and Christian Painting, Poetry, and Politics. In addition to his scholarly publications, he has written for the London Review of Books, The Nation, The New Republic, Raritan, and Descent, and has contributed to numerous documentaries and films in Europe and the United States. Professor Nirenberg teaches in the Committee on Social Thought in the Department of History, and he is the Dean of the University of Chicago, University of Chicago Divinity School. Following his remarks, he will engage in Q&A with fellow Divinity School faculty member, Professor Wilhelmine Auden, Professor of Theology, the History of Christianity, and Director of the Martin Marty Center for the Public Understanding of Religion. Through her scholarly work, Professor Auden analyzes early medieval thought and theology as an amalgam of biblical, classical, and patristic influences which, woven together, constitute their own intellectual matrix. Within this matrix, the place and role of nature and humanity interest her the most. Thank you both for joining us today. Dean Nirenberg, the floor is all yours. Thank you. Um, you're witnessing a medieval historian trying to cope with Zoom, PowerPoint, and other programs simultaneously. So forgive me if I fail. Uh, thanks, Colin, and thank you all for being here. I'm going to share my um, PowerPoint with you, and I'm going to play it from the start. Um, now, let me begin by saying that you often hear the word unprecedented applied to COVID and to our present situation. You heard I'm a historian. Actually, Villamine is also a historian. We historians hate the word unprecedented because it threatens to put it out of work. If something is unprecedented, then the study of the past has nothing to offer the present. But of course, COVID is not the first pandemic humanity has experienced, nor is it the first one to have profound effects on economics, on polities, on faiths. We don't know how profound the lasting effects of COVID will be. Well, we don't know how profound they'll be and we don't know how lasting they'll be. And that's a source of great anxiety and uncertainty. But we do have books we can turn to for a sense of what those effects have been in the past. Whoops. Um, you've all probably heard of Jared Diamond's Guns, Germs, and Steel, which is largely about the power of pandemics to shape the long span of human history. And I bring you uh, William Rosen's book, Justinian's Flea, which focuses on the first bubonic plague pandemic as a factor in the fall of the Roman Empire and the rise of Islam. In fact, pandemics have been part of the human experience 
for as long as humans have clustered together in sufficient population densities to sustain them, which is to say for as long as humans have recorded history. The U Chicago core curriculum that many of you uh, partook in is full of earlier examples. I think of the plague that opens the Iliad or the plague that struck the Israelites in Exodus, Exodus, both of which, by the way, precipitated debate and protest against authorities, uh, against Agamemnon and Moses, respectively. I'll give you just a few examples with their infection rates or infection fatality rates by way of comparison of, of these multiple pandemics, of a few of the multiple pandemics. The bubonic plague, the so-called first pandemic um, of the sixth century that Justinian's flea is about, had an infection fatality rate of between 30 and 90 percent, depending on the kind of plague um, that, that you caught, and uh, cost the lives of at least 50 million people around the Mediterranean alone. The second plague pandemic, the famous bubonic plague of the Middle Ages, had also an infection fatality rate of about 30 to 90 percent, uh, and it cost the lives of about 50 percent of the population. We, we say 30 to 70 percent, depending on where. Think of it this way, if the lowest range of the bubonic plague's fatality were taking place in the US today, it would mean the loss of 100 million people this year. Um, the third bubonic pandemic uh, had a, even had a San Francisco outbreak um, that had an infection fatality rate of about 10%. And it had important political consequences in the US. It led to the making of the Chinese Exclusion Act permanent, for example. So this is not the first pandemic that raises questions about borders, etc. Smallpox in 18th century Europe, it was endemic in 18th century Europe. It had an infection fatality rate of about 30% and was among children much, much higher. And perhaps the most lethal of all uh, pandemics is the smallpox amongst indigenous inhabitants of the Americas after the European discovery, so to speak, of the Americas. Uh, brought smallpox to the new world, it had an infection fatality rate of around 90 to 95%. And it's estimated that some 90% of the population of the new world perished from smallpox. Uh, perhaps the, the, the pandemic about we, which we know the least, but which was of, of enormous um, significance. And finally, COVID. Um, I put question marks because we don't really know yet the fatality, the infection fatality rate. Um, observed case fatality rates in places where the disease has spread so far ranged from 12.7% in Italy to 2.2% in Germany. But since it's thought that most infections go undetected, the infection fatality rate may be closer to 1%, of course, varying greatly according to age and risk factors. So when we say unprecedented, what we mean is that this pandemic is something unprecedented in our lifetimes and experiences as inhabitants of a world with widespread vaccination and effective antibiotics, two things that we should not be taking for granted. Maybe we mean something like unprecedented in the developed world since 1918. In fact, some of what's happening today could feel strangely familiar to someone who studies the past. So what I'd like to do today is share with you some of those feelings of familiarity, because I think they can tell us something useful about the crisis we're living through. As an aside, that very word crisis from the Greek uh, entered the English language in the translation of a plague treatise written by a man who caught the plague, Guy de Chaliac, who was in Avignon in 1348, survived the plague and wrote a chirurgia magna, great surgery, which was translated into English in the 15th century, and that's where our English word crisis comes from. Um, so what I'm gonna do to create this feeling of familiarity, I'm gonna bring together two seemingly very different strands of my own research. I know professors are always talking about their own research, but uh, it's what we know best. The first strand began with my doctoral dissertation, uh, which included a chapter on the effects of the medieval plague violence of the medieval plague on violence between Christians, Muslims, and Jews. And the second began this year with a collaboration on religion and public health, 
between the National Opinion Research Center, officially NORC, the Associated Press, the Divinity School and its Martin Marty Center for the Public Understanding of Religion, whose director, Wilhelmine Otten, is moderating today's questions, and three dear colleagues at Notre Dame, Michigan, and Yale, Craig Byerlein, Katie Lofton, and Genevieve Zubricki. I propose to stage for you a collision between these two research projects, between a distant medieval world and our own society, in order to make a couple of basic points. The first point is that both pandemics provoked what an egghead might call an epistemic crisis. That is, a shaking of confidence in the knowledge and the habits of thought and life with which we're used to making sense of our everyday world. The second point is that there are important similarities in how humans in previous pandemics have reacted to such crises and how we're doing so today. The third is that religion has played and still plays an enormous role in those reactions. And the fourth is that these reactions often produce conflicts between different systems of knowledge and value. And I'm gonna speak specifically between religion and medicine, public health, and that how we react to such conflicts really matters. I'm gonna start with epistemic crisis. Think back just a few weeks to the early stages of the pandemic when we were all avidly consuming news of the virus's progress across the globe, waiting for it to arrive in our own communities and being bombarded by constantly changing observations about its symptoms, infectiousness, modes of spread, possible prevention and treatment, even its lethality was widely disputed. How was it spread? What amount of distancing was sufficient? If my partner has a cough, should I move into a different bedroom? I remember the New York Times had an article on, can we hug our children? Remember the debate about PPE? Do masks work? Should healthcare workers wear them at all times? Should we all? What sort works best? On the right hand of your slide, I've given you an example of, this isn't medieval, it's 16th century PPE. Am I in a high risk group? Does asthma increase your risk of death? Or, as a doctor recently told me, does it even decrease it? Does this drug the president is taking work, or doesn't it? We've all just had this experience. My colleague, the historian of science, Lorraine Daston, writes that at moments of extreme scientific uncertainty, observation, usually treated as the poor relation of experiment and statistics and science, comes into its own. Suggestive single cases, striking anomalies, partial patterns, correlations too faint to withstand statistical scrutiny, what works and what doesn't. Every clinical sense, not just sight, sharpens in the search for clues. And eventually some of those clues will guide experiment and statistics, what to test, what to count. The numbers will converge, causes will be revealed, uncertainty will sink to tolerable levels. But for now, we're back in the age of ground zero empiricism and observing as if our lives depended on it. I love that phrase, ground zero empiricism. Medieval people had a similar experience in 1348. In fact, reading the newspapers this spring, I, it, they took me right back to this beautiful building in which I spent a year a couple of decades ago. Those of you who have traveled in Barcelona may have seen this building, the Palace of the Lieutenant. It's been many things, including the regional headquarters for the Spanish Inquisition. But during the year I spent within its walls, unfortunately it wasn't the headquarters of the Inquisition, it housed the medieval archives of the Crown of Aragon. And I sat there reading all the correspondence written and received by King Peter as his spies, agents, and ambassadors across the Mediterranean wrote with news of the plagues spread from east to west. One informant reported the observation, I'm not gonna, this is, I don't invent this stuff, I just report it. One informant reported the observation that many people sit or lie down before being suddenly taken ill. He wrote, perhaps the plague is spread by a poison sprinkled on the benches on which men sit and put up their feet. So the governor urged the king to be careful about sitting on benches. That's ground zero empiricism. Now, um, I was sitting in Barcelona, which is at the end of this red arrow, 
Uh, the plague started in the east and it made its way through Genoese colonies uh, in, in the Black Sea and Crimea, Crimea. And then because medieval people sailed port to port, it slowly made its way along the Mediterranean. And that this too was what I'm gonna call an age of ground zero empiricism. And in fact, it's striking how quickly observation in the Middle Ages coalesced into actionable, though not necessarily effective, knowledge. Let's take a look at the reactions of one of the earliest Western observers of the plague, writing from Sicily in 1347. So he's in the middle of it. It so happened that in the month of October, in the year of our Lord, 1347, around the first of that month, 12 Genoese galleys fleeing our Lord's wrath, which came down upon them for their misdeeds, put in at the port city of Messina in Sicily. They brought with them a plague that they carried down to the very marrow of their bones, so that if anyone so much as spoke to them, he was infected with a mortal sickness, which brought on an immediate death that he could in no way avoid. There's two things I wanna highlight here in this record of first contact between Western Christians and the plague. One thing I wanna highlight, and it's gonna come out throughout today's talk, is theodicy. That is, there's a divine explanation for what's happening, why bad things happen, why a good God brings about bad things. In this case, it's the Lord's wrath, and the Genoese are fleeing their misdeeds. There's something they did wrong. And the second thing I wanna stress is the empiricism. Some scholars of plague have assumed that the chronicler is describing the pneumonic variant of the disease, which is spread by droplets, coughed, and which is fatal to about 100% of the infected. Other early observers, like Boccaccio and his Decameron, quickly observed that the clothing of the sick transmitted the disease to those who might wear it or touch it, presumably because of the fleas within it. He didn't like that. And all of these observations were immediately put to practical work. So I'm gonna share with you some public health measures taken in 1348 in Pistoia in Italy. And you'll see that the first one is about closing the borders. So that the sickness, which is around Pistoia, doesn't come into Pistoia. You can't let anyone go to the neighboring towns. That was entirely revoked a few weeks later, presumably because the disease had spread across the whole region. Then a second one, stop trade in contagious goods, no carrying of cloth, et cetera, bedding, et cetera. Social distancing. Uh, when someone dies, for example, no gatherings of 10 or more, no funerals, no one shall dare to come together in the large groups, not except the very, very closest kin. And anyone who has lost a relative uh, in Madrid or, in, uh, or, 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 to, or loved one to COVID knows that this social distancing around funerals is extremely painful and is going on, of course, today. And finally, religious liberty versus public health. These ordinances are to be observed until the 1st of September or until the 1st of November. You get a feeling it's what it's like to be a governor in times of pandemic at the discretion of the Anciani and the Gonfalonier, saving that anything in them which is contrary to the liberty of the church shall be null, void, and have no effect. Public health versus the liberty of the church, an issue in the Middle Ages as it is today in the United States. As I'm sure you know, the United States Supreme Court issued a 5-4 ruling on the question May 29th, which I'll return to at the end. Across the Christian and Muslim world, questions like these were raised and debated, with some insisting that the faithful should continue to visit the sick, bury the dead, and gather to pray in church and mosque, while others insisted that such practices had to stop for the sake of saving lives. Let me give you just one Islamic example from Ibn al-Khatib, chief minister of Granada and royal physician whose ground zero empiricism led him to insist on the closing of mosques, social distancing, and public health measures. Uh, I quote here from a treatise he wrote in about 1349 called Convincing the Inquirer About the Terrible Disease. And he says, one principle that cannot be ignored 
is that if the senses and observation oppose traditional evidence, in other words, if empiricism tells you something that's different from faith, the latter needs to be interpreted. And the correct course in this case is to interpret it according to what the group that affirm contagion say. In other words, according to what empiricism is telling you. And he goes on to quote the, the Islamic law and says there are many texts that support this, such as his saying, may God pray for him and grant him peace, the sick should not be watered with the healthy. To play deaf to such an inference is to be malicious, to blasphemy against God, and to hold the lives of Muslims to be cheap. And he quotes Quran uh, Surah 2, Ayah 195, which prohibits contributing to your own destruction with your own hands. In other words, it's prohibition of suicide. Um, if you want to read more about Ibn al-Khatib and his work around the pandemic, um, you can read the dissertation of Muhammad Balan, defended here at the University of Chicago last year, chapter five. So Ibn Khatib al-Khatib is credited with saving his caliph's life by completely isolating him for a year. The king of neighboring Christian Castile, by comparison, died of the plague. His explanation for why the plague spread doesn't seem so very different from those one might expect to hear from a public health expert today. For example, not enough social distancing, repeated contact with the infected at funerals, exposure to their clothing and items, living in close quarters with the infected and overcrowding, plus mismanagement, carelessness, lack of awareness due to widespread ignorance and the absence of knowledge among these, about these matters among the masses. Of course, I don't mean to imply that these were only or even the dominant explanations for the plague in 1348 just as they're not the only explanations people offer for COVID today. We've already touched on another explanation, one that can easily coexist with empiricism and medicine, both in the Middle Ages and today, and that is theodicy. So this is from a letter sent by Edward III, King of England. It's called, the letter is called Terribilis because of its first word, terrible. And the letter simply says that God is terrible towards the sons of men because he punishes those whom he loves in this mortal life so they won't be condemned in the afterlife. He allows plagues, famines, conflicts, wars as a way of chastising us and driving us away from our sins. So if plague is caused by something we've done wrong, then we should think about what we've done wrong. And indeed, medieval people did that. Here's a poem translated from the, old Eng from the Middle English on the vices of society, about why plague, plague is killing men and beasts, it says. Why? Because vices rule unchallenged here. And then it goes on to talk about the sloth of the shepherds, meaning the leaders, the trusting are tricked by the cunning of the traders, fraud, avarice, poor, uh, poor and rich, etc. And it also encouraged, I think, uh, another explanation, another why we've talked about a theodicy. It also encouraged the emergence of a new kind of scapegoating, one that we today call conspiracy theory. In fact, Carlo Ginsberg, a very uh, eminent colleague and a friend has, has, has devoted a large part of his career to showing how conspiracy theories he would claim were born in this period around the Black Death, which is witch trials, blood libels, etc. So here you have this belief, commonly believed, it says, in Germany, that certain men called the Jews poisoned the waters of the wells used for drinking, and other humans uh, and other human uses with a very potent poison. By the way, I've looked through the trial transcripts uh, that in which Jews tortured under this accusation, are forced to confess what wells they poisoned. And one of them is Evian, from which um, the spring water that many of us have on occasion tried comes from. So be careful is my point. So these are some of the whys that people offered for pandemic in the Middle Ages. Each why, and I, I'm gonna show that they're also offered today. Each why suggests as well a different answer to the question, so what's to be done? We've already seen some of the public health measures, social distancing, PPE, et cetera, with which medieval and modern officials sought to counteract the why of contagion. Of course, they also sought to counteract the why of conspiracy as well, 
hear from the same chronicler who told you about the conspiracies of the Jews, you hear about what happened. Therefore, the Christian people throughout nearly the whole of Germany, moved by these reasons, rushed upon the Jewish race with fire and with the most violent fury, stained their hands with their blood. And their nation perished, namely Hebrews of both sexes, at the hands of the Christian, so that neither the nursing infant nor the child enclosed in its mother's womb was spared. Fortunately, this last response has been mostly, but not completely, uh, been absent in the U.S. today. Uh, on, the, on the left, you have uh, from the Nuremberg Chronicle uh, an image of the burning of the Jews. And on the right, you have a, a protester from one of the anti-shutdown um, anti protests uh, bearing a sign uh, of a rat wearing a yamulka and a star of David uh, saying the real plague. I will say in the U.S., um, it hasn't contributed much. Coronavirus hasn't contributed much to tension between religious groups. In other countries it has, such as in India, where it's fueled powerful tension between Hindus and Muslims. And the why of theodicy also suggested ideas about what is to be done. It animated reform movements across both politics and piety. I'm not gonna talk much about the politics, although many of the things centralization of tax structure, the Hundred Years' War, peasant revolts, all of these things were um, reactions in part to the destabilizations of the plague. But I'll mention just a few of the religious transformations. The emergence of new forms of prayer. Um, so here's Edward telling his people, in order to save the country from plague, what we need to do is pray. How should we pray? The plague provoked new ideas. Um, here, for example, is a prayer to the Virgin Mary, uh, specifically written to protect from plague. And on the right, I've given you um, uh, Lipo Meni's uh, altarpiece in Orvieto, painted in the 1350s, again, in response to plague, showing you the praying people. They're not praying this particular prayer to the Virgin, but they might, they might have been, sheltering under her cloak. And throughout, uh, un until modernity, you will see many paintings in many churches showing the Virgin sheltering the populace under her coat. And sometimes you'll see arrows coming from heaven, bouncing off her cape. Uh, those arrows are plague arrows that she's protecting the, the people from. Um, new forms of religiosity I have here on the left, also from the Nuremberg Chronicle, an image of the famous flagellants, um, penitents who sought to avert God's wrath by extreme forms of piety, which included self-flagellation and public uh, processions of prayer at the flagellation. And it's also been argued that the Reformation was itself uh, to, in, in, in some ways a consequence of the shocks to uh, Christendom of the plague. What I want to say is that none of these responses that I've just shown you in the Middle Ages are archaic. We see similar ones in today's pandemic across the globe among adherents of every faith. Here's a slide uh, from Jeanette Sinding Benson's research, uh, which shows you Google searches for prayer, which surged to their highest level ever recorded uh, in the period around when uh, the World Health Organization declared the COVID-19 pandemic. To give you a sense of um, how much they increased, um, they amount, the increase in, just the increase in searches for prayer amounts to the equivalent of about a quarter of the decrease in searches for anything to do with flying. So just like people used to search for flights, now they, a quarter of them at least, started searching for prayer. Uh, so in the time remaining, remaining, what I'd like to do is dig a little deeper and see what we can learn about these responses in our own society from our recent religion and public health survey. Let me begin with a question of faith versus public health, which we saw debated in medieval Christian and Islamic societies with the arrival of the plague. So we asked respondents, during the coronavirus outbreak, please indicate whether each of the following should be allowed without any restrictions, allowed but with restrictions, or not allowed at all in the United States. As you can see, there is widespread support 
for restrictions on constitutionally protected activities in the context of this pandemic. I mean, both uh, religious services and protests, rallies, the uh, political expression in public. In fact, only 9% of Americans thought that in-person religious services should be allowed without restriction, and only 8% thought that protests, rallies, or marches in public should be allowed without restriction. Um, this is obviously a dated poll, even though it was from the beginning of May, I suspect today would see different results. Um, the evaluation that people seem to be, the response people seem to be giving, seems to, to me at least, to correspond to a sense of danger. There's much more support for drive-through religious services, and indeed there's more support for allowing visits to parks with restrictions than for in-person religious services or rallies, and that's presumably because people are weighing what they've been told about public health risks of those activities. The same that seems to be true when we ask respondents explicitly about whether or not they think these restrictions violate freedom of religion. Their responses seem to reflect some evaluation of trade-offs between public risk, public health risk, and religious freedom. And I also think they, 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 evaluate, they, they seem to reflect a, a kind of gut reaction to the difference between the word prohibition and the word allow, but with restrictions. Prohibition elicits a more negative um, response. This is true even amongst the groups most likely to see a violation of religious freedom in restrictions, namely white evangelical Christians. What I want to stress is that this is not because Americans are uninterested in religious freedom. In a poll we conducted in, conducted in mid-February, that is before the pandemic in the US, the vast majority of respondents said that religious freedom was somewhat or very or extremely important to them. But in that same February poll, they also showed that they don't treat religious freedom as a right or a freedom independent of or absolute over others. For example, we asked respondents to, we asked them explicitly about children's vaccination exemptions based on religion. As you may know, religious exemption to, to vaccination is allowed in many states in the US and it's used with great frequency. It, it may be the most frequently used exemption for, vac for vaccination. So we asked them, a parent does not vaccinate their children because of religious beliefs against this practice, and the children are denied enrollment in public school because of its policy that all students must be vaccinated. So there's a clear conflict here. According to our poll, nearly three quarters of Americans think that unvaccinated children should be denied enrollment, and the same amount think that this denial does not constitute a violation of their religious freedom. I at least found these results surprising, given the high visibility of religious freedom arguments in politics and in the courts during this pandemic. As an example, consider the draft guidance for reopening the country that the Center for Disease Control and Prevention put together a couple of weeks ago. It included using disposable dishes and utensils at restaurants, closing every other row of seats in buses and trains, it also recommended that congregations observe religious services via live streaming, and it warned against certain practices like the sharing of hymnals and prayer books if in-person services were conducted. The CDC's draft was shelved by the administration reportedly over concerns that its guidance on religious service violated freedom of religion. So I find the results surprising, but I also find them heartening Across much of the world, from Israel and Saudi Arabia to South Korea and the Vatican, governments and faith leaders have understood the risk of religious gatherings in this pandemic and worked together to address them in the US as well. That is the kind of compromise we will need more of in the future. This is probably not the last pandemic and the dangers posed to public health by infectious disease will not go away. Indeed, they may only increase if predictions about widespread antibiotic resistance come true. And bear in mind, I'm a medieval historian, not a epidemiologist or, or medical researcher, so you can not believe anything I've just said if you like. 
To meet the challenges ahead, we will need every medical tool at our disposal, perhaps especially vaccination. But we'll also need a political virtue as well. And again, I'm not a political scientist. The ability to resist the tendency to amplify tensions between different rights by turning them into conflicts. Our polling suggests that the vast majority of the American people recognize that religious freedom and public health need not be mutually exclusive. Our courts also seem to agree, though they're much more divided. The United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit in San Francisco ruled two to one that the shutdown orders did not single out houses of worship for unfavorable treatment in the May 22nd ruling that the Supreme Court upheld 5-4 on May 29th. South Bay United Pentecostal Church uh, versus Gavin Newsom, governor of California. The, two, the unsigned majority opinion from the Ninth Circuit said, we're dealing here with a highly contagious and often fatal disease for which there is presently no known cure. Then they quoted a famous dissent from Justice Robert Jackson, which by the way was given in a free speech case in the city of Chicago, in which Father Ceminiello gave a, a speech in the midst of a riot, urging um, the, it not, not, he didn't say extermination, getting rid of the Jews in the United States. Uh, and the Supreme Court upheld his right to do so. But in the, minority, uh, in the minority opinion, in the famous dissent, Justice Jackson wrote, there is a danger that if the court does not temper its doctrinaire logic with a little practical wisdom, it will convert the Constitutional Bill of Rights into a suicide pact. So I can't help noticing as a medieval historian and not a constitutional lawyer, how much the Ninth Circuit sounds like Ibn you know, Khatib the medieval chief minister of Muslim Granada, uh, who invoked the Quran's prohibition on suicide in support of his public health measures against contagion. So I'd like to conclude with a topic I find fascinating, but also a bit mysterious, and that is American theodicy in the age of COVID. In our May poll, we asked respondents what they thought caused the COVID crisis, the why question that we saw our medieval people answering. I confess that I phrased and I discussed with my collaborators, uh, I told them that as a medievalist, I found that question fascinating. And I, I, some of our options um, were intended to see uh, whether things have, uh, similar explanations are given today. I was surprised by what we did not find. Human sinfulness, minority religions as scapegoats, those medieval favorites don't figure high in American minds as causes of COVID. 11% for human sinfulness. People of non-Christian faith, 3%. Atheists, only 2%. Neither do climate change, immigrants, global trade, some hot button issues in our political culture, or even nature, other things in nature. When it comes to causes of the crisis, Americans in a plurality favor a different explanation that ancient and medieval people also frequently adopted, government. In this case, Republicans were more likely to blame foreign governments and Democrats their own. But Americans do think of COVID in religious terms. When asked if the pandemic had strengthened or weakened their faith, over a quarter of Americans responded that their faith was strengthened. Again, there are differences among faiths, ethnicities, and political parties. White evangelical Christians are more likely to say that their faith has grown stronger compared to other Americans, so 36% versus 24%. 33% of Republicans say their faith has grown stronger compared to 20% of Democrats. Moreover, a majority of Americans think that God will protect them from infection, 55%. Here too, there are important differences. 67% of white evangelical Christians think so, compared to 53% of other Americans who believe in God. Even more interesting to my mind, is that 63% of Americans believe, 
like medieval Christians believed, that COVID is a message from God telling humanity how to change how we are living. But notice that here the differences are reversed. Only 48% of white Americans think God is demanding change, whereas 73% of black Americans and 65% of Hispanic Americans do. This is astounding insofar as it suggests that there are two different American theodicies on offer. One, largely white and evangelical, does understand God as acting intentionally, most likely to protect them from infection, but sees no divine criticism in the pandemic. The rest of believing Christ Americans, on the other hand, and especially African Americans and Hispanics, see in the pandemic not only the actions of God, but also a message from God telling us that we need to change the way we are living. How should we explain the differences between these two theodicies? One, apparently more set aside with the status quo and the other more critical. And what does that second group, the group that believes that God is telling humanity to change the way we are living, what does it think the changes should be? We didn't ask them that question. So although we can all imagine some answers to the questions I just posed, the surveys we've done to date don't provide them. Still, I think answering them will be important. And I think many of us could propose answers based on our knowledge of history or sociology or political science or economics or religion or other things. Answering those questions will be important, especially if the COVID pandemic provokes, as so many other pandemics across human history have, remember that English poem about the vices of society, if the COVID pandemic provokes movements of protest and reform in both politics and piety. Thank you, and I welcome your questions. Perfect. Um, thank you, Dean Nirenberg. Can you hear me? Yes. Good. So um, let me start with um, uh, a question that came in actually by two people. So I just wanted to ask it. It's more a question for clarification, namely why you omitted the 1917-1918 uh, influenza in your survey of plagues, say? I omitted it just because it seems to be one that has been very much talked about. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, those of us like you who work in the Middle Ages, we, we, we keep on wanting to call attention to the past. So I, I chose what I think are lesser well-known examples. And in fact, the least well-known example is probably the most important pandemic. And that is the smallpox pandemic in the New World. And in fact, in all in all in Australia and other places too, all places that were um, colonized by Europeans who brought the smallpox, the smallpox with them. Good, good, thank you. Well, let's go to uh, a, a more historical question then. Uh, this is a question um, from Philip Eberhardt. Uh, it's actually a question and two comments attached to it. The question is, has it happened before that during a plague, societies decided to close places of worship? Has organized religion shrunk? And the comments that go with it is that he says, it seems to me there's been surprisingly little scapegoating during the COVID-19, except uh, some try to blame China, China perhaps. Um, but also he adds, since the beginning of the pandemic, I haven't heard any criticism of Muslim face coverings. Yeah, um, I mean, I will say, I, I also, I think I noted that I was, that there has been very little scapegoating in the US. Um, early in the pandemic, I showed you one, one protester's sign and my colleagues Facebook with whom I, I have worked on, on, fate spe on hate speech policy did let me know that there had been, a, a, there was, that they were working with organizations on a flare up of conspiracy theory uh, posts on Facebook about um, minorities and COVID. But I, I would say all in all in the US it's been uh, remarkable how little of that there has been. I think in, in, in India, I'm sure you read about um, greater tensions and, and in and some other countries as well. Um, 
the closing of places of worship, that, that's actually why I brought to you uh, Ibn al-Khatib, uh, because he was locked in a, in a debate uh, over precisely that. Uh, and in, in both um, medieval Europe, and Christian and Islamic um, societies, you found uh, complaints, you found some authorities complaining that places of worship uh, were being closed or neglected, uh, and other authorities saying that they had to be closed and neglected. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I think this, this tension, uh, that was very much why I want to bring to you that less well-known material from Granada. Uh, you have a beautiful um, example of the prime minister uh, engaged in a kind of war of pamphlets with one particular uh, theologian over his, his decision to, to enforce social distancing. Yeah. I think the commonality between the past and the present was really striking in your presentation. Now here's a question from uh, John Bennett saying that according to prominent Judeo-Christian conceptions of God, how much agency does God have in the creation and spread of plagues, pandemics? And he imagines that the answer might actually um, require multiple perspectives. Wow. <laughs> Uh, is a really interesting question, and in a way, it's the one that was so that so bitterly divided uh, response uh, between, let's say, theodicy and empiricism. That those two uh, things I offered. So let me go back to the Islamic example uh, of Imam Al Khatib and his debate, because it's very, very similar to uh, questions Christians face. And again, there are many kinds of Christianity many kinds of Islam, many, kind, many different notions about what God's omnipotence and benevolence might entail. Um, but the whole argument against contagion was that, uh, that it seemed to take volition away from God and put it in the hands of the bacterium. And in the case of plague, it's a bacterium. In the case of COVID, it's a virus. Um, and for a theologian like Ibn al-Khatib, you can take a step back and say, no, uh, God creates that too, right? So, so where you see God's um, work happening became a big debate. Uh, and, and you had to see it happening in different parts. You could see it happening in nature. So many medieval Christian um, texts would say, God commanded nature to create this plague or God commanded the planets to align in a particular way so as to corrupt the atmosphere, so as to create this contagion, so as to punish humanity for its sins. So even the general cause is caused by God. So there are many ways of thinking about God's omnipotence and how uh, you can then explain why the disease seems to spread by its own mechanisms and in its own way. Uh, and, and I would say there are about as many different answers to that as there have probably been um, believers confronting their own suffering. If I may throw in a question, it also just came in by Igor Rosenblit, but that forces you to sort of combine the present and the past. He asks, is there a historical analog for the split between conservative and liberals on the best way to deal with the pandemic? Huh, that's, uh, you know, because I think that every age has its own particular um, forms of, I'll say sectarianism, by which I mean both religious um, differentiation and political differentiation. Um, the word can, you can use it in, in both cases. And I, I do think that, um, so, I couldn't find, I wouldn't look for a precursor for our own exact political situation. Mm -hmm. um, but I would say that uh, in, in every case where there has been pandemic, whatever the underlying fractures are in that society mm -hmm. uh, can tend to uh, announce themselves, can tend to be reinforced and to uh, and be amplified. So uh, for example, um, tax uh, struggles over taxation uh, between the church, the aristocracy, the king, and the peasants paying the taxes became much, much sharper when there were fewer peasants to pay those taxes and, and uh, 
people in power were fighting over them more, which produced massive revolts, things like the Hundred Years' War, things like the Trastamaran Revolution in Spain, the 1381 revolts in England, the peasants' revolts in Germany that Luther wrote about. Uh, so all of these, you could argue, are the inherent tensions in that particular system of polity, economics, etc., being amplified and uh, by, by the crisis. Yeah, thank you. Well, a question really about uh, the plagues from uh, David Manushak. How many years or decades did it take for recovery from previous plagues? You know, that's a really fascinating question and um, very difficult to answer because, of course, um, things keep evolving, right? So you can, if you look at Europe, uh, let's just look at Western Europe and the consequences of the Black Death. The population in Western Europe did not start to really recover for something like 300 years. It takes about 300 years before you reach uh, and really start to dramatically exceed pre-plague populations. That's because the plague returned in multiple uh, pandemics. Uh, sometimes it would in, second, in its second return, it mostly killed children, people who hadn't gained any immunities in the first time. It's also because there were other diseases as well that, that, that uh, came. Um, so it depends on what you mean by recovery. At the same time, that labor crisis provoked by the plague transformed technology. So to replace the absent humans, people invented things like new plows, new forms of plow, the printing press. Um, they put water to work in new ways. And eventually, uh, as you know, uh, they produced a lot of mechanical work. Um, it even, you might say that that drove in turn uh, transformations in media. So the printing press is itself a, a device made to save enormous amounts of labor at a time when labor is extremely expensive. Um, but at the same time, it changes the possibility of communication. It's not an accident that most of the images I showed you of the burning of Jews or flagellants uh, or uh, many other uh, blood libel I could have shown you um, are from the early age of printing in which you get the dissemination of memes. Um, I'm calling memes, that's a very historical thing to say, but you get the creation of new images that the new technologies created as a reaction to the labor crisis make possible. And I suspect that you will see similar things as our own forms of work are changed by changing public health situations. In fact, I think we've just lived through such a moment. It might be that someone looking backwards will say that the ways in which uh, people in the developed world worked were transformed by this pandemic. Yeah. Uh, a question more on the point of theodicy that you brought up a number of times. Um, from uh, Roxanne Guggen, did the beliefs and truths during the plague change afterwards? What was held true before the plague that was altered most? Uh, I mean, I would say, I would say, I'd say that's a really hard question. Boy, they're all hard questions. I would say two things I'd, I'd point to. Um, one is, apocalypticism, um, the, the kind and, and, and mystical movements um, that were very much reactions to these enormous shocks. I mean, I think it's hard for us to really imagine what it would mean for 100 million of us in the United States to die over the space of a few months. Um, but it, it certainly changed the way in which people uh, felt, experienced their devotion and changed their devotion itself, new forms of devotion especially mystical and, and, and new expectations of the end of time. So uh, those apocalyptic expectations shaped a lot of things. It's really interesting the degree to which Isabel and Ferdinand and Isabel in their own sending of Columbus to discover the new world were motivated by the conviction, Ferdinand's conviction especially, that they were messianic kings and that Ferdinand was the last world emperor. So the whole world had to be converted and brought under Christianity and Jerusalem had to be reconquered within his lifetime. Those kinds of, um, the kind of apocalyptic thinking about power uh, and empire was itself to some degree a product of these shifts. And the other shift I'd say that's still very much with us, uh, more than 
uh, The Last World Emperor, is conspiracy theory. The idea that secret groups within society have it within their power to destroy society. So it wasn't just the Jews, it was in the plague, it was largely the Jews. Um, other groups were also singled out uh, in much smaller measure. Uh, even some clergy, uh, pilgrims and such were, were singled out. Um, but later you'll find, uh, for example, witches uh, and the great witch hunts. Um, and, and this makes its way into political thinking as well. So it's not, it's not entirely, it's not just about scapegoating minorities. Uh, I think uh, thinking about Freemasons, that what we call the conspiratorial frame of political thought, uh, some people have argued is a new way of thinking about the world that was born out of um, the Black Death. Yeah. Uh, a question that also just came in from L Lorraine Barba is about um, overseeing the historical record, but also the surveys that you've done with the Marty Center. To what extent do you think that the tension between religion and contagion plays into or exacerbates a, a larger tension between religion and science as modes of thinking? Um, that is, oh wow, another very difficult question and one I wish I knew the answer to. Um, remember that I am really I'm reluctant to get into uh, the, the uh, culture wars of the moment. Um, I do think that there is a struggle over um, not so much, I would say not so much between religion and science as between certain forms of expertise and certain forms of politics. Um, and that drives, um, drives a political process which can also mobilize um, religious communities. But I, I don't think we're back in the days of the Scopes monkey trial or anything like that. I think we are in a moment in which um, the, the, the attacks on uh, research and on the credibility of experts and on university expertise and, and um, uh, yeah, in general are, are higher than they have been in a long time. And I do think that that is a, a it's a dangerous moment in terms of the integrity of, of, the, of, the, of scientific work, but I don't think it's driven by uh, religion. A question then maybe more specific to also the Marty Center survey that you referenced. To what degree is the conviction that illness is a punishment from God present in 21st century American religious groups? So that was one of the things that I really struck me about our um, survey. If you remember back to Hurricane Katrina, for example, I think we all remember reading in various newspapers things that were said about why Hurricane Katrina struck New Orleans. Uh, it was the sin of, it was the presence of gays in society or this sin or et cetera. That, that sounds a lot like the kind of medieval theodicy that I described. But if you ask people today, uh, what's the role of human sin? And we didn't ask what sin, but human sin in general. And I think I would have thought that would have, been a capacious enough category. As you saw, only I say only, you may think that, that that's a, a very high number, but 11% um, attributed to human sin and uh, a role in, 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 in God's sending the pandemic. Uh, so I would say that that's probably, that, that form of theodicy may not be as powerful as we sometimes think it is, or as, we, or as the media might, make us, um, might lead us to believe it is. Uh, but we wouldn't really know without much more specific uh, follow-up. Mm -hmm. Maybe uh, going back into history for uh, uh, another question from Noreen McGrath, what was the perception of medical treatment and the medical field during the plague? And how does that compare to the modern experience? It's really interesting because we are at a moment in which uh, with the COVID pandemic, medicine had relatively little to offer. I mean, it had life-sustaining uh, uh, ventilators, et cetera, but it, didn't, it doesn't have a medicine that can uh, cure. And um, 
and yet I think you know society did mobilize itself very much around uh, our medical uh, professionals. In the 1348, that was a similar situation. Doctors had nothing to offer, um, or very little to offer. Uh, and some of them were actually blamed for, uh, especially in later pandemics, for sowing the plague in order to make profit. Uh, so there was this kind of, uh, and there certainly were people suggesting that doctors um, couldn't help you, that this showed all of their wisdom to be false. But on the other hand, Ibn al-Khatib, the, 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 the royal physician of Granada, he was the royal physician, became incredibly famous or uh, powerful in his own polity for having successfully saved the lives of the entire royal family by social distancing and isolation at a time when um, many other royal families in Europe were falling like um, everybody else. Thank you. I think we're going to turn it over to the host now. Um, thank you all, and thank you, Wilhelmine. <laughs> Professor Otten and Dean Nirenberg, thank you both for your remarks and time today. In true U Chicago fashion, I imagine we could have continued for hours engaging in rich and thoughtful discussion. I can think of no better way to end our virtual Harper lecture series. We hosted our first virtual Harper on April 13th, and now nearly two months later, more than 12,000 of you have joined us live and thousands more have watched a lecture on our YouTube channel. As the quarter comes to a close, the virtual Harpers are taking a pause, but please know they will be back and you'll be the first to hear when the new lineup is ready. Before we part ways, I wanna say two things. First, to our alumni and friends on the front lines of the COVID-19 pandemic in Chicago and across the globe, thank you. And to our alumni family, particularly our Black alumni, who are hurting over the events of the past week and the systematic issues that led to them, the UChicago alumni team sees you and we stand with you. We know the UChicago community has the talent, intelligence, and resilience that can help us in the ongoing effort to fight structural racism. And we will share links to university resources and programming in the coming weeks. Please reach out to us if you have resources or thoughts you want to share with the UChicago alumni staff. Until we meet again, virtually or in person, I'm Colin Hennessy, wishing you all good health and well-being. Thank you for joining us. You may now disconnect. <laughs>